Welcome to Rule of Thirds, an offshoot of our Screen Refresh podcast. Our goal every episode is to take a little break from watching and analyzing movies, to dive headfirst into some nostalgia, or just get a little creative. So every month we select a different topic and create a top list that may or may not be dear and dear to each of our hearts. Shoot us a message on Instagram, X, Facebook, at Screen Refresh, or send an email at screenrefresh at gmail.com to let us know what your top three would be or suggest any future topics. I'm your host, Tim, and I'm joined by the rest of the Screen Refresh crew, Dean, Nick, and David. Hello. Hello there. Hi. And today we're going to be taking a look at some movies and projects that have been stuck in development hell, whether they are still there in limbo or ones that finally ended up seeing the light of day for better or worse. So get ready. Rated R. I picked this one only because it's always you hate us. something. <laughs> It's always something that comes up and there's been a lot of movies that I feel have been announced recently that, oh, wow, they're actually making a, a like a sequel to this. And, you know, like Beetlejuice comes to mind, but it's also it's less development hell and more just I don't think they planned on making this this whole time. And then it's just Michael Keaton's getting old and, you know, like, hey, I got nothing else going on. Should we do this? And then I think enough people said yes, where that's how it kind of came to be. But then you have a few other movies where you've been hearing rumblings of, oh, they're going to make a they're going to make a movie for this. And nothing happens. You hear names getting attached to projects and then it just kind of falls uh, you know, to the wayside and then you don't hear anything again for months and months. And then a couple of years later, you hear something else like, oh, this person dropped and now this person's in. Like, are they, though? Sometimes, I mean, in the, in the modern society where I can just open up Twitter and, you know, at somebody like, hey, are you in this movie? And they actually have a chance of seeing it and replying back. Um, sometimes I do wonder, like, can I ask these people? And it's just like, is this even really a thing happening or is it just some BS article? I don't know, but I figured it's a more different topic to, uh, approach. It kind of reminds me of like the Donald Glover Spider-Man debacle on Twitter, (laughs) (laughs) where I think someone just said like Donald Glover should be the new Spider-Man and then just got so many likes and retweets and then Donald Glover comments, comments on it. And he's just like, what? I'm like, I'd yeah. do it, but I'm not. <laughs> Tom Clever for Spider-Man. Why don't we just have Michael Sayer play Shaft? Uh, yes, please. <laughs> I forgot that about that broke comparison. buying tickets. One more for Michael Sarah's Shaft, please. <laughs> you know what? Just give me 10 tickets, just because. <laughs> just give me this whole row. <laughs> yeah, I do like that eventually he ended up getting to voice Spider-Man, and I think it was Ultimate Spider-Man on Disney or something like that. Um and then pairing as the Prowler, well, prematurely the Prowler yeah. and the MCU. I do. I don't want to digress too much, but I do feel the time for Peter Parker is like, I think we're done. And I feel the studios need to just switch gears and like focus on Miles Morales for a little bit. Clearly. I don't know. I think he's, if we've learned anything from Batman, he clearly has at least two more origin story <laughs> movies out in him. Because it, it, he's definitely like the, the Spider-Man video game did extremely well into the spider verse and across the spider verse obviously is doing extremely well people i think are fully ready for a miles morales story and it's not like a pandering thing or like ah, we have enough spider-man movies let's do something else and it's still a spider-man movie it's just a different approach and i think now is the time to do it yeah i mean it could be I mean, I I think Marvel's in a tough place with like trying. They're trying so many new things, and nothing is sticking. That like, I f- I almost feel like they need to double down and go safe. They need to hire people that have read the comics to mm-hmm. to do. Uh, or like, they need to just decide go do what we hired you to do because I know they've been hiring a lot of directors. Like I think uh, I want to say Nia DaCosta did the Marvels. And coming off stuff like Candyman or things like that, and then from what she explained was, I came to do a movie, but it wasn't really my movie. It was essentially, you are directing Kevin Feige's Marvel movie for Disney. Mm -hmm. So it's like, they hold your arms down for a lot of it of like, don't do too, too much. Um, So I just want to see them say like, you know what? 
do the blade movie do it a rated r go nuts do whatever you want also like just anything you want to do like legion when they did that on fx and it was just wackiness with um what's his name dan stevens it was just does not fit in with the rest of the mcu just make an interesting story uh, my theory is that um i hope this isn't anyone's picks but it's not technically in development hell because it was announced but the blade movie when they do make it i think nothing has tracked yet because they're waiting on deadpool's reception i think hmm. once to, to see like the violence level and rating yeah, issues. Yeah, because I think mm-hmm. once that is like once they get over that hurdle enough. Obviously, Deadpool is like an extremely different movie than Blade, but with the violence that Blade comes with the property, I don't think you can properly pull that off in a PG thirteen setting. So with that in mind, I think this is their first foyer into a rated R movie. Let's see how it goes, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it'll be hard for them. I mean, it's like how some people just want to ice skate uphill, but. (laughs) (laughs) Someday we'll choose that movie, David. I mean, I hope we do. Yeah, I I think it's going to be an interesting phase for them going into this just because it's going to be how do we incorporate Deadpool in his movie, which they like here, be rated R, do your thing. But then how do you incorporate him into any sort of crossover with anything else? And unless they just really lean into it and he even just breaks like the fourth wall and just talks about or makes comments about how he can't say certain things or he can't do certain things right. <laughs> well it's even hard because like he's, he's paired with colossus but like that version of colossus and how he interacts with deadpool doesn't even really fit super well with the 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 x-men like tone yeah so it's it, it's almost like it's even like a different version of the x-men that he would be like coming into contact with because it's it, it's certainly very different in tone than at least some of the i mean i haven't been super up to date on x-men i think the last one was like age of apocalypse but like well, the X- it just it, it feels the off. x-men continuity is a like for as great as the sony uh, the the 20th century fox x-men movies are they're amazing if it wasn't for them we wouldn't be here today with all of the different superhero stuff that's currently going on because it was one of the ones that got the foot in the door but their continuity is terrible and i'm constantly hearing Mm. like well this superhero isn't really or this this mutant really isn't that one they clearly change it to do xyz and then this person isn't exactly like that in the comics and then like this person does that it's just it's way too all over the place just to fit a narrative and i can you can definitely tell they're trying to throw in as many different mutants into a single movie as they can so i don't know and it's I, i mean my own personal view of it is i think they shouldn't bring in mutants period into the mcu because they've got their own shit going on it's it's true like there's a real clash of I mean, they never even, I mean, they came into into contact in the comics every so often, but like, it's almost like a very different kind of world where it's like, how are people not accepting of the mutants, but also incredibly accepting of superheroes who are basically mutants? Like, it's probably because there's a lot less of them. I mean, yeah, that's, that's kind of a lot of the storylines like, um, between like Averse X and all these other things, but yeah, it's right. to the point it where the... it was always crossovers, though, right? It was never like, oh, Captain America and Colossus team up. It's like what? Oh no, <laughs> like they, there's a lot of them where they end up kind of doing stuff together for the most part, or any of the ones who are like part of the mutants that also cross. Like at some point, everybody's an Avenger. Like mm, I'm surprised true. none of us are Avengers at this point in the comics, but like the when they form their own island nation and then they kind of segment themselves from everybody else um like i think that's still going on in the current lines but it's i do want to see them introduce the mutants because i'm tired of them trying to tiptoeing it around of well we didn't have the rights to doing the x-band so we don't want to give anything to the mutants so we can't say the word mutant so we're going to change it and certain characters that were mutants aren't anymore and that's when they started pushing the inhumans because it was like black bolt and uh, medusa and all of that of Mm, well now we're going to push the inhumans because we do have the rights to that So then it became to the point of the MCU being popular enough that then they started changing the comic stuff 
of all of a sudden, I think Miss um, Marvel, they decided was either she was a mutant and then became an inhuman, or they decided to retcon her from like an inhuman to a mutant, um, like Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch, all of a sudden, they're no mm-hmm. longer mutants. They're not Magneto's kid. They're now just like two other superpowers and all this other stuff. So what was the original it's movie? all jacked up. What were we talking about? <laughs> I believe it all stems from from uh Blade. I think it stemmed from that. <laughs> I love that line. It's so good. And it was improvised. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it even better. I didn't know that. Yeah, it was improvised. Oh, but uh development hell. Oh yeah, but Blade, is that what you mean? No. Yeah. Or, no, what no. how's that tied? What? what was the de- development hell movie you were gonna talk about? The new Blade movie? Oh yeah, I th- I think Blade is um stuck in development hell currently because they want to have um they want to see the feedback from how Deadpool reacts with their crowd right. because of the rated R nature. Cuz that shit rated was announced R. like 4 years ago and he got like a shitty voice cameo in Eternals and then that's it. Hey, I'm Blade. I don't know. Maybe they're I don't just know relying on the fact that nobody saw Eternals or waited to the end. <laughs> or maybe they're trying to create enough of a gap between uh, Morpheus. I'm the cool Morpheus. Marvel man. Morbius. What is man. his name? Morbius. 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 There we go. I mean, it's Sony versus Marvel. Well, yeah, but, Marvel but proper, I guess. Morbius and uh, Blade do have a lot of run-ins. Well, yeah. I mean, and Morbius and Spider-Man. After watching, well, that'll have to. After watching Madam them. Web, I definitely want to watch Morbius now because. That one was bad, so I can only imagine how much better Morbius could be from that. I here's the thing. Uh-oh. I saw Morbius. Oh, as an adaptation, terrible. As a movie, it's a fun summer like popcorn flick. Like I, I don't think it was absolutely abysmal. It was stuff that I can laugh at in parts. Other parts, it's like okay, genuinely, like that's kind of cool. Like it's a fun choice for some of these things. But like everybody giving it like a 0. 0.5 out of 10 kind of deal, I think it's like a solid 3.5. I don't know. Did you see Madam Web? Though? Madam Web, and I was going to be like, uh oh. <laughs> <No. laughs> I've not heard good things about Madam it's, Web. It's um, yeah. It's I I I I do pirate. I do download movies, and whenever it comes to cam quality movies. I always wait until like the actual digital release comes out. I didn't do that with Madam Web. Like, no, this is a train wreck. I don't want to give the studio money to see, but I need to see this train wreck. And it is bad. It's bad. It's one of the films of all time. I save those movies for my flights. So, uh, so Nick's pick was Madam Web. <laughs> um, <laughs> David Dean. Wait, no, that's not my pick. Wait, that's it's not, not your pick? It's not in development hell. They made it. You you Fair didn't play. pick Madam Web. You've been championing Madam Web for like <laughs> years since the announcement. Well, I mean, you know, you I just me it I really Blu-ray. I really like Dakota Johnson, you know, and she her avid enthusiasm in the recent interviews just really bolstered how much I was happy when they finally made this movie. I mean, for anybody saying, like, she's a bad actress because of Madam Web, I think of, like, she was good in the Suspiria remake, so it's clearly, like, it, it's it's a scripting and directing and, like, the project itself probably isn't there. There might not be any heart there. But also, I feel like they did everyone in that movie dirty because all of the ads that I saw and all of the commercials literally were just like, Madam Web, here's four reasons to watch this. Sydney Sweeney, Sydney Sweeney. Sid-. And they just keep doing that. I'm like, this is your own Sony. This is your own movie. There's other actresses and you're only pushing one supporting character. How do the rest of them feel over this? Just the huge tracts of land, I guess. <laughs> The fact that the fact that Dakota fired her entire like management team over this movie is enough to tell you that she got fucked over big time when she got hired on to do this. 
Apparently she thought it, they told her it was MCU. It was not just Sony. It was going to have direct impact on the rest of the Marvel stuff. They, I guess they promised her a lot of different stuff when it came to this movie. And then once she started filming, she's already locked in. She can't leave it. So, and you see her enthusiasm drain as that uh, progress bar in the movie keeps going on. And by the end of the movie, you can tell she's just phoning it in the best she can. I feel like if someone, if someone, I mean, I'm clearly not an actor, but if someone came up to me and was like, hey, you're going to be in a Marvel movie. And I'm like, yeah, I'd be super excited. And then they said, oh, and it's being produced by Sony. I would just immediately be like, oh, all right, I guess. (laughs) Sometimes I can't, I can't blame the actors or like, I can't blame. Oh, like, oh, that sucks that, you know, she got conned like that. Like, well, at the same time, don't jump on a, you know, a meal ticket bandwagon without knowing the material first, maybe you should have put two and two together when you realize who's producing it. And the whole track record of not a single Sony movie has had direct tie in with anything Marvel thus far. And they're only nor have any of them been really any good. Like they've all been just kind of passable. Yeah. Like Venom was probably the best one in the sequel. Not yeah. so much. And then of course the yeah. Spider-Man got into the, the Spider-Man movie, but They've been there for years. Like you're just fresh off the street. Nobody knows who you are yet. Meh. So you're the madam sure of this web. You're Madam I'm Web. Sh- my my actual pick, unfortunately, does have Jared Leto in it, and I haven't looked up anything more yet. But um, with the recent announcement, my pick is going to be Tron Three. Wait, so your pick wasn't Blade? We've been just BSing for 20 minutes yes. and riffing off a fake pick. Yeah, it never was a pick. I don't understand why you thought it was a pick at all. Bait oh, switched. because I was trying to find out how we got on this, and I thought it was a pick, no, and then I said we Blade. we just digressed. Uh, Tim, I'm editing the, the episode. Who cares? <laughs> but no, my actual pick is Tron 3. That has been in development hell. I didn't know it was going to even be a movie, and then all of a sudden it's like, hey, we're making it cool all right whatever and then finally it's like oh jared leto's attached to it oh shit there's pictures attached to it now they're actually doing this it's for real now so no that's after watching tron 2 i really liked it and that got me into watching the original tron because i never saw it as a kid i fell in love with the um tron 2 that one was just visually it was a really great idea sound design was amazing the whole story was pretty cool not disney's greatest but at the same time it it I liked it a lot. And then flash forward, it kind of left off that it could have a sequel and nothing happened to it. And that came out, what, like 10, 12 years ago. And then finally they announced that, hey, we're going to be making a third one. And I like with most other movies that I'll bring up after everyone's picked, you don't really think anything of it because especially with Disney and certain properties that they own, unless it's, they didn't like Nightmare Before Christmas when it came out. And then once they realized how much of a cash cow it really is, that's where they started to throw more money into it. And now you can't go down the street during October without seeing Jack and Sally plaster all over the place. So in the same thing kind of with Tron, um, they're starting to realize that people really did like the sequel and uh, the whole Tron saga or like whatever. So they're making the third one finally, and I'm kind of excited for it. I still haven't seen Tron Legacy. I haven't seen anything with Tron. I'm completely on the outside of those. Don't watch the original one. The the original one has like a a laughable moment. It's good to riff on, but um, the second one is a lot more serious down to earth. And even just the way that it's um, the visual style, you can immediately tell the difference between the original and the one today. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I think that's remains the only movie i ever watched in 3d on my plasma 3d <laughs> television oh really <laughs> that i had in like 2010 i mean that's a good one to watch it it did have enough uh like things that would have popped out i don't know if it was a 3d movie when it came out cuz i remember yeah, I there was remember. a few that were you know heavy handed on the the 3d gimmick in the theaters this might have been just one like- that just died, right? Like that they don't do that anymore. Yeah, that Finally. Was, that was like a that was a really weird time period where everything was 3D and uh, like everything was 3D. I think that was the the big thing. I think Avatar was the last one to come out, the new one. 
way of water. Mm. But I really wish and hope that that fad dies down. Yeah, yeah it was big for a while. I mean, remember the 3DS? Yeah. The 3DS was actually cool because I didn't need glasses for yeah. it. Yeah. And it did have the option of turning it off. It wasn't like you were locked in on. Oh, that's good. Yeah. It was a little just slider on the side of it. Tron mm-hmm. 3. Tron 3. Tron Where Aries. would they go from there? Don't I know. forget the end of the movie. Tron 4. Time. I mean, the fact that Jared Leto's <laughs> in it um, is a little bit of a turnoff for me. But um, I'm hoping he doesn't go method he's, and gives everyone like viruses or something on their computers. But he's he's very hit or <laughs> yeah. miss. But he's hit or miss, and in all real, like in all seriousness, when it comes to his acting ability, he's not bad. I do, you know, his stuff isn't bad. It's just he has a lot of bad press around his it's movies. The man. Yeah, whenever something comes out, and with Tron especially, like I'll watch the first trailer when it comes out, but I'm not going to look into it. I kind of. I started a new thing where like um, certain trailers are unavoidable because like if you go to see the new like movie that comes out this week and then, you know, you're going to see trailers regardless of how you kind of go into it. And if a movie has a trailer that you want to see and you're avoiding trailers, what are you going to do? Like close your eyes or like, you know, plug your ears kind of thing. That's the only time I'm willing to see the additional trailers after the first one. So I'm not going to follow Tron, just like how Ghostbusters, I haven't seen anything after the first trailer for Frozen Empire. I want to be able to go in and just enjoy it. So for now... God, I want that movie to be good, but I'm just... Oh, so do I. Oh, Yeah. We'll see. But um, with Tron, same thing. I don't know anything about it. I just know that they are actually making it this time, and it actually looks pretty serious this time. And that the release date isn't uh, tentative and it's actually going to come out when it says it is. Which is. 2025. Yep. Uh, oh, and there's a lot of people. Supposedly. On that. Supposedly. I hope so. We need those. It's called the cast. Movies. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Tron 3 is coming out. There's no, they only have two actors. There's in no it? people in it. Yeah, Evan Peters, Cameron Monaghan, which would be cool. Greta Lee, Sarah Desjardins, and Gillian Anderson are so currently. Wait, in, in Tron 3? Yeah, currently attached to it. Oh, wait. So is that not the same as Tron Ares? That is Tron 3. Oh, I didn't see any of that cast on. Jillian huh. Anderson's always welcome addition. She is. Now I'm more interested. Yeah, but like I said, we'll see if that actually sticks. I don't know if they've begun filming or what, but showcases Ares, Leto's computer program on a journey from the digital world to the human one. And that's that's <laughs> rated that's R. It. Rated R. But we'll see. It's worth watching too if you're bored one day and. You want to see like a good spectacle. The special effects in it is really great. Hmm. My pick is a movie that I simultaneously want to see and don't want to see because I feel like 12 year old me in September of 1998 already had this transcender (laughs) transcending experience (laughs) That I don't know if a movie could surpass. That um, is one of the movies that I didn't want to mention because I felt you would have said it. Really? Mm-hmm. Good job. It makes us able to keep the episode going. <laughs> um, in 1998, the video game Metal Gear Solid was released. And they've been trying to capitalize on that for at least the last 10 years. Easily. Um, probably longer than that. Um, it's, it's such a tough thing because I guess for what, I, what are the rumblings that well, there's barely rumblings, I, I guess, as it stands, but they can't find the story says Oscar Isaac, who was cast as solid snake, like three or four years ago, or like right before the pandemic or something. Mm-hmm. Um, doesn't the game have a story that, yeah, can't and they I guess, find that story? I mean, I, oh, I mean, assume that it's, it's not a great is, story. <laughs> so yeah, Tim, as a non Metal Gear Solid player, that's I came in at two. Yeah, and you stopped Raiden's yeah, my guy. You, it, it gets so much worse. It doesn't make any I sense. I think a, a Metal Gear movie from Metal Gear Solid 
and keeping it there, I think would be great. But if you try to incorporate yeah, you try all to build of the current lore something. into a Metal Gear Solid movie, it would collapse. It would not work. Yeah, it was I seen... mean, they would need to start with Snake Eater. I no, right? No, I don't. Right. I don't think if if they start with Snake Eater, they're setting themselves up to fail. It'll be like the Warcraft movie all well, over again. I think. I think the problem is though, is that with if they do a Metal Gear Solid movie and they do just Metal Gear Solid, it's just a run of the mill spy movie. There's nothing interesting about it. Yep, and that's also probably where they're struggling to try to find the uh, the story because it's just pure exposition. Yeah. Like, I mean, Metal Gear Solid, like, it really is half the movie. It's just characters talking at you. And outside of that, it's just like, hey, you're a spy. Go do spy stuff. I mean, like, by the time you get to the fourth game, the cutscenes are like four movies long. Yep. Right. Well, I remember <laughs> playing Metal Gear Solid 4, and it's like, play 10 minutes, watch a half hour of cutscenes. Play 10 minutes, watch a half hour of cutscenes. Oh, yeah. That first playthrough, it takes you I like a week and a half to oh, beat I it. I loved it. And then when you play on your second playthrough and you have the ability to skip all the cutscenes, you realize like, wow, this game's like half hour long. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I that w- I had a moment at the end of that game where it's it's like that. I think there's a name for it, or somebody came up with a term for it, but it's like when you finish a book and it's like emotionally drain drain. I mean, you enjoyed it, but it's like wow i just went on this journey and like nobody knows and i just like you're sitting there and you just have this like emptiness about you you know what i mean yep like nobody knows this thing i just went through and it was awesome and it's like now it's over and like what do i do now with my life i had yeah. that, I mean, that game when i finished phenomenal. the first game yeah why don't they do a metal yeah. gear movie wouldn't they start with that <laughs> I don't think anyone knows what that's about. What if they film it top down? <laughs> yeah, they start start like, with the original game. The actual, the actual yeah, the first Doom game. movie we were promised, shot entirely in first person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Hideo Kojima, the creator of the game, seems to have moved on to adapting his Death Stranding into with a24 i guess that's kind Ugh. of been moving for, moving forward um so that also kind of not puts the nail in the coffin but definitely puts metal gear back yeah. on the backpack backpack burner you know and it kills me too because i i've never played that and when i heard it's just like the, a fedex delivery game in a walking simulator <laughs> they're actually a big sponsor of the film <laughs> it's just i i it's tough to want to play it Mm, that that was actually a buy and return for me. Yeah, I've heard terrible things, and the whole premise seems stupid. Like, look, man, I like Norman Reedus as much as the next guy. I love Boondock Saints. I love The Walking Dead, but the premise seems so stupid. So join yeah. us on Screen Refresh Twitch next week when we all play Death Stranding. Uh, <laughs> and right after That's... that, we'll do uh, Heavy Rain, Tim. You and I. <laughs> I'd watch that one. I thought you wanted to play love... a game, though, David. I actually love Heavy Rain. <laughs> and then I we'll love do... Heavy Rain. But David and I, the, the only time we've ever had like an actual bitter argument in our life was in my parents' kitchen <laughs> arguing over, I said, Heavy Rain is a game. And he said, Heavy Rain is not a game. It's an interactive movie. <laughs> well, you can um, add you can add Until Dawn and Metal Gear Solid 4 into that category. Well, I mean, Metal Gear Solid 4 has enough. Um, I'll say, oh man, we could do some great uh, Twitch streams, including my, uh, uh, what is it? The, the Telltale Games Batman full <laughs> silent run. <laughs> <laughs> who do you think batman so listener just load up the telltale games batman game and every single time you're prompted for a choice do nothing do nothing either click the uh three ellipses choice or let the time run out you will have a much better time with that game that way and uh spoiler <laughs> nothing changes the story is still progresses okay well yep. it's like yeah, people's you- argument about indiana jones in Raiders of the Lost Ark, that it's a, if he just did nothing, the exact same thing would probably play out. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, the Telltale Batman, you can, I think I got through almost three quarters of the game of picking nothing or picking three ellipses, <laughs> and the game just doesn't care. Like, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> but you have a choice. You have a choice, but also, if you don't choose, you, that's a choice. <laughs> 
Metal oh. Gear. Metal Gear. So, David. Um, so, I went about this a little differently because I picked one of my favorite movies that was in development hell, <laughs> but, but came out. Um, I hope that's okay. No, pick yeah. nothing. Pick something else. Oh. Pick okay. nothing. Uh, nothing. <laughs> um, so, so my my movie that I chose that was in development hell and was in development hell for for uh, my math is wrong, but twenty two years ish uh, is two thousand two's Gangs of New York, really? um, w- which is a phenomenal uh, Martin Scorsese film um, about like the early kind of development of new york city and like the violent past of it with leonardo dicaprio and daniel day lewis uh also cameron diaz uh henry thomas jim broadbent and john c Riley. very brief john c Riley. um and the movie's production actually technically started in the mid 1970s <laughs> um what? yeah martin scorsese uh wrote the uh, wrote the screenplay that he adapted from the book that he read um, and was completed in 1977 and was pitching the screenplay in the late 70s uh, and had, had gotten a sign on from a production studio. But after, um, I don't know if you remember the movie uh, in 1980 called Heaven's Gate, which was kind of like a oh, yeah. historic, historical fiction that totally bombed and had a high production value. Um, he was the studio basically just said, "Oh, actually, never mind," because all of a sudden there was no faith in having like a a big production like historical fiction movie. Uh, and the movie had gone through like a whole whole bunch of phases. There was one point when like Robert De Niro was apparently signed on for it. Uh, there was a phase of the movie where I'm trying to remember who the musician was. Um, Meatloaf. Uh, what is? No, 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 oh, no, Bruce Springsteen was signed oh. on <laughs> to do a bunch of the music. Scorsese apparently had planned. Oh, back for the when mu- it was Gangs of New Jersey. <laughs> had planned for the music <laughs> to be like a narrative device for the film. Um, and it wasn't until like, uh, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to remember what the date was. I can't remember offhand, but eventually Harvey Weinstein signed on to produce it with Miramax. Um, and that's why when it started to gain traction, but apparently Harvey Weinstein and Scorsese were at ends so, so much. Apparently they fought over everything, even including just costumes. Good. Get like, him, Marty. Yeah. Right. They were just like, there was costume issues, budget issues. Um, Disney had signed on to it for a little while, but then got turned off because they realized how much violence was going to be in the movie. <laughs> Disney's gangs <laughs> of New York. Yeah. They were like, oh yeah, we'll do it. And then they're like, nope, no, not at all. Gosh, um, it's butcher bill, Mickey. <laughs> Uh, so there was just so, so many problems and like really intense fights between Harvey Weinstein and, uh, Martin Scorsese, um, that even after it was finally signed on with Weinstein and Miramax, uh, it wasn't, it was, I believe it was like another, like six years of production before it finally came out. Um, yeah. Gangs in New York. I saw that in the, um the I, I when i was researching this episode like oh what to uh pick and like you know lists of movies in development hell and like just to try mm-hmm. to get ideas and i noticed this one popped up on a couple of them and i i i saw it but it wasn't going to be my choice but i'm glad that you picked it cuz i was going to go back and see what that explanation was cuz i thought it was weird to see that one cuz it didn't seem like that would be the kind of movie to be in production hell yeah, because it won like ten Academy Awards. Like, yeah, no kidding. It was it was a rousing success, mm-hmm. and I remember um, liking it a lot when just, I saw it too. It was a good movie. Oh, I thought I thought it was great, but yeah, it just kept changing hands, and yeah, it was kind of a nightmare. But like, I mean, Leonardo DiCaprio, Daniel Day Lewis, like, come on. Yeah, that is my choice. Gangs of New York. You did it. I did it. I've learned something today. I never happened. realized that that was stuck that long. I thought it was just like, and next movie. Yeah, I I, I thought it was really, I mean, it, I, I feel like the 1977 doesn't truly count, maybe, as still being in development hell, but like it was signed, so I could guess. Yeah. So 
Biopic is a movie that is still stuck in development hell, oh. um, as is a majority of this director's other movies over the years, it sounds like. But that is going to be Guillermo del Toro's At the Mountains of Madness, based on the novella by H.P. Lovecraft. This evidently kicked off back in uh, 2010. He was originally going to adapt this the At the Mountains of Madness into a movie with James Cameron producing. I think they were eyeing Tom Cruise to star. And it has just been a slog since then of it's off, it's on, it's off, it's on. Um, it's the ongoing thing in the horror community of people just like, maybe someday we'll be real excited, uh, but never seems to be doing it just because the ongoing problems of the studios wanting to not back a R-rated, bleak, uh, like high-budget horror fantasy film. I was going to say, it's got to be the budget that's really stopping it, that he needs to do it the way he wants to do it. Yeah, just because all of the the ongoing, like the the storyline itself, all of what would end up requiring of it, like all of the the elders and the Shoggoths and like all this stuff. And they showed a, I think the only thing they ever released was just a CGI test, I think a few years back of what they were expecting or they were just testing out for it. And if this was like the upgraded and the entire film, like it, it was going to cost money. Um, especially just the idea of like a, an Antarctic mountain expedition, but it's that, that, unfortunately still stuck. Of H.P. Lovecraft's like novellas, that's such a weird one to pick. I feel like, like, I f- I feel like it's the most like recognizable name of his novellas, but like of the ones to choose, like I don't know. Maybe I, I'm just feeling like it's it's because of where it's set and like i just keep thinking of the thing like if we're doing an arctic horror movie like (laughs) it just feels like everyone's gonna be like oh like the thing like okay like i know it's very different but like i I just feel like there's such a a wealth of like stories to choose from if you want to do hp lovecraft i kind of like it because that one at least i think would be more fun to try to make yourself than trying to explain cthulhu to somebody and it do- well i mean not even not even cthulhu like cthulhu is only in one story sure really. but i mean he's but the like, poster child for lovecraft so you know i'm true. sure the studio probably wants cthulhu but uh, del toro wants to do something a little more nuanced that he knows he's gonna be able to have fun with not just from like set design and creature development but just you know you get in the minds of people and you get to show off horrors beyond just what you physically see and to really put the actors through a better pace and he can draft a better story with it versus just here's a big ass monster i have to create a a story around like yeah it could be done but that's also why i think there's not that many cthulhu movies ever because i feel it's just like low-hanging fruit that no director would want to try Mm. I, well, I mean, as far as I know, because I remember like trying to deep dive and find them. There's only there was only two at least mainstream H.P. Lovecraft movies, and they're neither one is like an adaptation. They're both kind of like a inspired by, like, and I just feel like there's so many different stories, and I'm just like, oh, why that one? Yeah, but, I, mean, I, th- I, I think it's because At the Mountains of Madness makes sense in terms of introducing introducing people to concepts of mm. the mythos. Because it's literally just it's the expectation or the expedition of these guys going there and then slowly like actually visually seeing some of the creatures and then learning some of the lore and like seeing cave paintings and like understanding some of what's going on that I feel like other ones it just felt very much a they never truly knew and then it was they caught a glimpse and then they went insane this one's a little bit more like visually dynamic and at least Mm. we get some of the lore um that they were probably hoping like oh it would be a great one for people to be able to see and at least like they get they actually get the what they think in their head when they think hp lovecraft as opposed to people thinking like oh it's very lovecraftian not all of them are like his books aren't monster movies um essentially like they're more about like people going mad from the curse of knowledge and all of this um so they probably figured like oh this one yeah this is we can tell this story uh in a visual medium yeah that's true i guess i'm i'm just like a uh 
I'm not even sure what to say, it, but like more of a fan of like the Dunwich horror style ones where you yeah. have like the detective who's like infiltrating a town and there's the cults and like, oh, he finds stuff out and then you have that slow burn and then everything is like, oh my God, things are happening. Yeah, yeah like a shadow over Innsmouth or like... Yeah, like Innsmouth. more of his that style stuff. Yeah. So I will be happy if this ever actually ends up getting made, but unfortunately it's like after was this like 14 years or something like this i don't i don't think it's going to be getting off the ground unless it ends up turning into hey uh here go do a lower budget version of this just because you've always wanted to and he has to dial it back from the story he wanted to tell because after winning like oscars and all this other stuff if he doesn't have the clout he needs to get this off the ground i don't think he ever will yeah no Mm. i think he's gonna do it but that also, I wouldn't be surprised if just he has, uh, he strikes me as the type of person that's going to have 50 projects in front of him and he's trying to do all of them at once. So I don't think this will ever leave his table, but I think he's probably just trying to get his perfected version slowly. And he's just going to keep working on other things until he finally is able to like, all right, I think now is the right time in my life that I'm going to do this. Hmm. Yeah, I also wonder, like, does he normally get like the box office numbers that would warrant like that kind of huge budget? Because like, I I mean, I know, like, like, I love his work. And I think some some of it is like, so like, incredibly creative and visually striking. Like, while I know, like, Crimson Peak did not do well, I really still loved it. I don't I don't think Um, he I don't think he does. Because I think the last one that he did that was huge, and it's not even... (sighs) I don't think it's fair to compare it is um, Pacific Rim. Oh, yeah. But yeah, that's kind of an odd yeah, one. Yeah, because that's like, oh, yeah, he's a great at doing a summer blockbuster kind of thing. Like, well, that's not really what he's known for. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's part of the trouble that, like, he's so art house yeah. that, like, giving him a huge budget is really worrisome, even though, like, his movies are great. They're just not necessarily Did you end like, up watching the, the Cabinet of Curiosities on Netflix? I didn't you actually I completely forgot about it. It's good. And then you can listen to our don't open this podcast episode where we cover every episode of that series. Mm. Oh, oh shit. I was on the fence about the, um, the fall of Usher. Oh, House it's of good. Usher. Yeah. I got most of the way through it. I mean, I, I was debating whether or not I was going to watch it and I listened to you guys talk about it and I was like, Oh well, I'll give this a real shot. Also. Cause I'm just a huge Edgar Allan Poe fan. Um, yeah. Which I did like how it was not exact copies of stories. It was, Mm -hmm. let's take all of these themes and ideas and like bits and pieces and incorporate them into a larger story. So I also really, really liked some of their story choices uh, on which ones they chose to cover because it wasn't necessarily just like the big mainstream ones. Whereas like some of the more nuanced ones that is like, it's like, oh, if you're an actual Poe reader, it's like, oh, this one, oh, you chose that one. Uh (laughs) Yeah. I forgot he did Pacific Rim. Well, because for a while he was doing things that were kind of more like mainstream blockbuster because he did um, like Hellboy, he did uh, Blade 2, he did Pacific Rim, like Hellboy 2. But then at some point, I think it was like 2013, 2014, he hit a streak of moving into like Crimson Peak, Shape of Water, Nightmare Alley, like all of these more art housey films. Um well, not necessarily like not art house when you think of art house mm. of like one French guy in black and white, like smoking a cigarette kind of stuff. But like it's more of the the stuff that the Academy would consider, which I guess makes sense because then Shape of Water won and I think Nightmare Alley was nominated. And he still can't get this off the ground. Shape of Water got a hundred and almost 200 million worldwide, which isn't huge worldwide, but sure it. The movie didn't cost that much. No, the studios, I feel, are just too greedy nowadays. I don't want to get on a soapbox about it, but especially recently, you can absolutely tell they're looking at movies now by the numbers, and they really don't care what it's about, who they're casting, what it's going to do. It's just all they care about is that bottom line. And as successful as Guillermo is, I don't think they'll ever greenlight anything that he does unless they know Mm -hmm. that it's going to be successful. Which is hard because his track record is not. It's not bad. Gangbusters. Yeah, it's not. He's he's really good at what he does. It's just he's not Spielberg. He's not James Cameron. You know. 
it, it it reminds me of like the resident evil movies where they just kept making them because like it kept turning a yeah. profit it like wasn't a huge profit but it was enough to keep making yeah. them <laughs> but like it feels like studios aren't going for that anymore because now in the world of like the marvel stuff it feels like unless it's making historic numbers they consider it a loss of like well it was 100 million and it made 300 million yeah but we really wanted to make that billion mark and really put us on the map it's not every movie's gonna be that you're now like making they, me like you're making me think of like uh video game publishers now yeah <laughs> yeah it's just it's like oh that new assassin's creed was a historic success but we really wanted 30 million copies and you only got 25 yeah. even though we only expected 10 <laughs> well i know we like people will this is well after the oscars but the oscars just recently happened and one of the people's speeches during it was you don't need to make every movie the 500 or 500 million dollar movie like make 510 million dollar movies or like whatever the case is like make more smaller yes forays into cinema tell more stories so this way it's not just oh you're gonna get the more the same yeah your portfolio let's bring back serialized movies and shorts and it sucks because as yeah. great as how endgame and infinity war was it's just we built to that you know there was a lot of movies leading up to that point and like yeah you did a lot you made a lot of money when those two movies came out but you need to realize this isn't something that this isn't every day every movie is not going to do this and the way that they marketed and did like ant-man and every major marvel movie since you can definitely tell that it's they they need to go back to the drawing board and that's just marvel but other companies too it really seems like either they're really scraping the bottom of the barrel or they're not actually trying i mean endgame and infinity war that's like a once in a lifetime yeah yeah like cinematic like achievement so so at the mountains of madness rated rated r presumably <laughs> I mean, rated r more than likely right it's gotta be <laughs> yeah yeah okay gang that wraps up another episode of rule of thirds and we'd like to thank you for coming along for the ride and discussing our favorite films in development hell as always you can reach us on instagram x facebook at screen refresh or shoot an email screen refresh at gmail.com to let us know what your top picks would be or if you have any topics you want to hear us discuss that's it from us so for nick david and dean this is tim have a great week take care of yourself and catch us next on screen refresh the first monday of the month and catch me on our sister podcast don't open this podcast every second and fourth monday This is ta- ta- I mean, I mean, I wanted to talk, like listen to what I was, listen to my intros and outros. <laughs> Rated it. R. Rated R. I always think of that that like <laughs> meme where it's like PG thirteen rated G for everybody. Rated R. <laughs> Rated PG. Rated PG thirteen. Rated R.